Good afternoon and welcome to our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar, Native Grassland Birds, Population Trends and Conservation with Dana Ripper and Ethan Duke. My name is Haley and I'm the Outreach and Education Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie Foundation. I wanna thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put those in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, I will read those out to Ethan and Dana. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow, along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. And now for some background on our speakers. Dana Ripper is a wildlife ecologist who focuses on birds and their conservation. She has a master's of science in eco ecology from Arkansas State University and worked on conservation projects in 10 different states before making Missouri home in 2008. Dana and Ethan Duke founded the Missouri River Bird Observatory, MRBO, in 2010. The organization is based in Arrow Rock, Missouri and conducts research, avian population monitoring, youth education, community outreach, and policy advocacy throughout the state of Missouri. When Dana is not working on MRBO, she enjoys vegetable gardening, maintaining a small native prairie reconstruction at her home, reading fiction, observing the behavior of backyard birds, and cooking and eating local, sustainably produced food. Ethan Duke hails from the Northern Appalachia where he grew up in deciduous forests. After a term of service in the US Air Force, Ethan completed a degree in wildlife management at the, Can at the State University of New York, Cobbleskill. He spent several years studying cerulean warblers in the Cumberland Mountains of Tennessee before coming to Missouri in 2009. When he is not performing IT and communications work, conducting education programs, or performing bird surveys for MRBO, Ethan enjoys restoring and maintaining his central Missouri property, hunting and fishing, learning about and playing music, and watching birds for the sheer joy of it. We're excited to have Dana and Ethan here today to learn more about their contributions to grassland bird conservation. And now to Ethan and Dana. Kaylee, thank you so very much. and. Thanks to everyone, Haley and Erica are here with us and everyone at the Missouri Prairie Foundation and all of you that are on the webinar today. That heart is not up there just because it's Valentine's Day. MRBO really loves MPF and we love working with you all and surveying on your prairies and doing events with you. So thanks for having us. Um, Haley really kind of went through a lot of this and I don't expect folks to read it all, but uh, the Missouri River Bird Observatory, MRBO for short, um, is entirely conservation driven and these are the areas in which we work. And as you'll see, the Grassland Bird Monitoring Project falls largely within science, but we also use the data as a foundation for education and outreach and also policy advocacy. So let's just get right into it. What are we all doing here? Okay, this is the why. Um, we can all be incredibly concerned about the loss of avifauna, birds in general, in North America. Um, if we weren't worried about it before, certainly when this meta-analysis came out in 2019, um, we learned through um, the folks at Cornell and National Audubon, American Bird Conservancy and others, putting together an aggregate data set that came from research studies as well as community science programs such as eBird. They put all of these data together um, for decades and found that we have lost almost 3 billion birds. Um, so about 30% of our birds in North America just in not even one lifetime um, in the course of 50 years. And folks don't even have to go to the journal of science and read the paper. This was widely reported in the popular press. So you might have seen a lot of articles about it, especially at the time. Um, so this is why we're concerned about our birds. If we dig a little deeper into this meta-analysis, we can see that it's not just rare species that maybe live in remote locations or perhaps uh, species that weren't necessarily numerous to begin with. Some of these are very common birds uh, that we've all grown up with 
and that we really do expect to see around Missouri and, and around the habitats that we all live in. So for example, barn swallow, this is one of my favorite birds, wonderful, amazing flyer um, that is here during the breeding season. And we've lost about two in five barn swallows since 1970. Of all of the guilds of birds in North America, it is our grassland birds that have taken the biggest hit in, in all of these declines. So you can see that we've lost over 50% of our grassland bird species since 1970. That's over 700 million grassland birds just disappeared, uh, including birds that you know I think we're all pretty familiar with, like meadowlark, of which we've lost about 75%. So really concerning trends. And I want to talk a little bit about why this is happening and what the Missouri Prairie Foundation, the Missouri Department of Conservation and others um, from, you know, other NGOs to private landowners, what they're doing about it and how we at MRBO are trying to help with that effort. So the big one here, habitat loss. I know that folks hear about this quite a lot. Um, and, and folks that are on a Prairie Foundation webinar may be familiar with the loss of Missouri's native tall grass prairies, but I always find this map particularly staggering. This is the extent of our tall grass prairie in the state of Missouri, pre-European settlement. And this is the extent of our native unplowed tall grass prairie today. Um, some of these little dots that you can see um, are in the hands of Missouri Prairie Foundation and others. There are reconstructions as well as this unplowed prairie, but really we're down to under 70,000 acres of, of our precious prairie habitat. And so with a loss this big, the only real logical conclusion to what will happen is that we're going to lose a lot of our prairie obligate birds, our grassland birds. In addition to, and very much related to and intertwined with this habitat loss, um, we have some other situations going on that are very much related. So much of our prairie habitat, of course, has been plowed and converted to agriculture of various kinds. This can be um, something like a, monoc a monoculture fescue field, like you see in the top right there. Um, in the early to mid part of the 20th century, we saw a conversion of native grasslands to a sort of small patchwork of farms um, that were a lot more diverse than they are today. Today, we've gone from those relatively diverse small farms to a situation where we have millions of acres of monoculture across the landscape. So we've gone from this incredibly rich, biologically intact, um, very diverse tall grass prairie landscape across the state to one of essentially these monocultures. And you can imagine if you do that, you've lost everything from soil microbes all the way up to birds and mammals and everything in between. So we've basically destroyed this incredibly diverse food web. Um, and this is the vast majority of our agricultural practices, unfortunately, across the state and the nation and globally at this point. So something that maybe is a little bit more hidden than just the conversion of, of what we see in a diverse prairie to this more monoculture situation, which you can readily see, um, is we also have a lot of different inputs. And these have changed over the last 150 years or so. Um, we have an incredibly uh, intensively fertilized um, and, and toxified landscape at this point, where even in some of our seeds that we use to grow crops, we have things like insecticides. Um, we're, you know, kind of constantly spraying herbicides and other pesticides and fertilizers and things across the landscape. And so we not only have this, this landscape that's a monoculture in terms of the flora, but also it has a lot of very toxic inputs. Um, of course, this is being studied. The results as far as birds and other taxa as well is really quite alarming. Uh, folks might have heard of neonicotinoids or neonics as they're often called. And 
the the rise of neonics across our landscape sort of correlating with even further bird declines um, across the state and the country. So just to give you a little example here, the the use of neonicotinoids that has happened since the this graph is the mid 1990s to the mid 2010s. And it's a concern is that um, we're often told that if we use these type of insecticides, we won't need to use any other type of insecticides. But you can see in the graph on the bottom that non-neonic use hasn't really declined either. So um, we haven't traded one thing for another. We're still we're still kind of using both. Now, from a bird perspective, um, we have a situation where even our seed eating birds, um, birds that you don't often think of as eating insects, uh, it during the breeding season, almost all of our species do use insects to feed their young good solid protein. Um, so as we're causing an immense decline in our insect populations on purpose, basically, um, we are also taking away the food of birds. So, you know, if you place this on top of habitat loss, you have a situation where our birds are trying to survive in a landscape that has become increasingly hostile to them. So where is that all going? Um, and I think this is important too, because even if we think of the changes in habitat and we think of the potentially toxic inputs that we're using, we also have a lot of outputs um, that are being used to make other outputs. So you can see some of the um, uses of our corn and soy, which are uh, what we grow most of here in the state of Missouri. And a lot of our grain crops then go to feed large animal operations. Folks might know these as CAFOs or confined animal feeding operations, um, which then in turn require a spreading of their outputs, manure specifically, solid waste, on the landscape. Um, thus, potentially in many situations harming soil health and also definitely degrading, degrading water quality. So all of these things are adding up to a landscape where it's increasingly difficult for birds and, and other organisms to live. So all of those things lead up to having a really, really small amount of especially high quality habitat remaining um, here in Missouri and throughout the tall grass prairie region. So landowners and land managers must try and manage entire ecosystems on very small tracts of land. So ultimately what the Missouri Prairie Foundation folks and, and some others are trying to do is take that 14 million acres of, of native tall grass prairie in the state of Missouri and everything that was contained in those acres and manage them on these really small blocks of land and, and try their very best to keep all of the organisms and all of the structures and the web of, of food and life intact on these much smaller postage stamps of land. So MRBO does not own or manage land um, as an organization. As Haley mentioned, Ethan and I have a very small uh, <laughs> reconstructed prairie that we manage and it's given us a lot of really good experience, I think, in sort of seeing what prairie managers are up against. And um, But we don't have as many organisms relying on ours. We try to, um, but something like an unplowed Missouri Prairie Foundation parcel is, is precious in the fact that its, its soil integrity is intact. Its plants have never been plowed up. Um, and so folks there are, are are the last sort of refuges, like the Noah's Ark of tall grass prairie in the state of Missouri. So um, knowing all of this, we thought to ourselves very simply, how can we help? What can we do as an organization, um, as far as science, education, and advocacy to help with the situation of, of keeping our, our prairie organisms alive? And so um, I'm going to give you a short history of how we kind of got to where we are as far as grassland bird data collection. Um, but it really started off over a decade ago. Um, the answer to this question for us was, was trying to provide robust long-term monitoring data on birds specifically, 
and helping to assess habitat management success by measuring bird response. So birds are really good indicator species. They're of course not the only thing that um, we can study uh, in order to assess the, how well you know habitat management is doing and the various practices are doing and what effects they are having. Um, but birds are one way and it's sort of the way we specialize in. So, so that was our answer to this question. Um, we started off in 2011. Folks might know the Coal Camp area. Um, it is it is a priority geography within the framework of the Department of Conservation's Comprehensive Conservation Strategy (CCS). Bit of a mouthful. Um, and these are these are prairies south of Sedalia, and you can see a map here of of the pieces and where they are, sort of in this fragmented landscape. Um, we started off in 2011 doing bird banding. As an organization at that point, we were doing quite a lot of banding and we employed this method. Uh, you can see there it says IBP pro protocol that is the Institute for Bird Populations. And we implemented this monitoring avian productivity and survivorship, aka MAPS protocol on three different sites in the Coal Camp Prairies geography. And in summary, what this protocol is designed to do is to be able to track demography of bird populations. So basically to answer the question, is this tract of land providing good enough habitat that this population living on this land is reproducing in enough numbers to sustain the population? Um, and, and banding can be a good way to get at that because you can tell adult birds from uh juveniles and birds that were hatched that year, et cetera. And you can compile those data to try and track demographics. As we'll see, this wasn't the greatest method in prairies. Um, we Here's just an example from Ionia Ridge Conservation Area. And you can see, I don't know if you all can, can see the wording there um, on the right-hand side, but uh, we have, we we set up our study area in high quality remnant habitat and warm season grass planting and remnant with cool season grasses. So these little flags on the left-hand side designate our net sites. So for this banding station. Um, and we definitely found out some really neat things, learned some cool things about birds in the area. You can see we caught some loggerhead shrikes and meadowlarks and things, um, but Catching birds in prairies is very difficult, very difficult. Um, and our sample sizes were extremely small for the questions that we were trying to answer, which is how is the management at these sites affecting these bird populations? Um, so one of the things that we did was we actually, while we were running these banding stations, we started um, implementing surveys each day on the band that we were on the banding site. And you can see here, GERSP is grasshopper sparrow and HASP is Hensel sparrow. And you can see that we were documenting quite a lot. And we were also documenting grasshopper and Hensel sparrows in the management units where they were expected. So this was remnant and it was at the time a little bit thicker. Um, and this was a relatively newer planting and the vegetation structure was more thin, which is what grasshopper sparrow prefers. Um, so we, we were actually documenting these individual birds via survey, but we weren't really catching them by banding. So ultimately we decided to move on from the idea of banding in order to answer management questions. Um, around the same time, a year after we started doing those map stations, we were asked to repeat some surveys um, that had been done at High Lonesome and Mora Prairies. And some folks on here might remember Andy Forbes. Uh, when he was with Audubon down here in Missouri, they did some of these surveys in, in the late 2000s. And so we wanted to replicate those surveys in 2012. You can see all the points. Basically, an observer would go to a point, do a seven minute point count, documenting all the birds in a circle around the point where the observer is standing and then walk to the next point, do the same thing, walk to the next point, et cetera. Um, so after doing one set of replication of these surveys, we realized that by standing in one point and only counting birds around that point, um, that might be a good method in say a forest but grassland birds can be very, very patchily distributed across the landscape. 
and um, because you're in open country, it's easier to walk um, and count birds at the same time, basically. Um, we felt that we would get some better data and certainly get a bigger sample size of our grassland birds, especially if they were more distributed in patches, as they sometimes are, if we did counts while walking transects. So you can see a circle here. This was one of the original point count circles. You can see that there's a bunch of Henslow sparrows and a grasshopper sparrow that are falling outside of that circle. And those birds weren't being entered into our count. Um, and so by walking along a transect, we would be able to kind of get as many birds as possible and cover more area. Um, so we pretty quickly in 2012 um, decided transects for all. We're going to do line transect surveys on, on prairies from now on. And so you can see, um, hopefully this is just the line transect design on Mora. So you'd walk transects, just like that, here's some of the bird results. Um, and obviously these are the bird four letter codes because all the names aren't gonna fit. You wouldn't be able to see, but Bell's Vireo, Dick Sissel, Field Sparrow, Northern Bob White, for instance. Um, in 2012 and 2013, we did these using paper data sheets and following a GPS unit, a handheld GPS unit. This was pretty common at the time. Um, one of the things that was uncommon in our methodology, even at that point, was this part right here, um, the mapping part. Hopefully everyone can see my cursor. Um, so as observers were walking along, the traditional way was just to say, oh, this bird is 20 meters from me. This bird is 20 meters from the transect. Um, what we wanted to do in addition to that was also map exactly where the birds were. Part of this was for accuracy um, to make sure that we were um, estimating the right distances. And we'll talk about that in a sec, why that's important. Um, but also so that we could end up with a map of birds and exactly where they were. So from a management perspective, this could be really important. Um, what happens if you burn an area? Do birds move? We're, we're not going to know that if we're just saying, oh, this bird was 30 meters from this transect. Um, we're going to know that if we have maps of where birds were. So back in this day, we took these maps and each of these birds that you can kind of see here that were put in pencil on a data sheet, we, we entered them into the program Google Earth, the, the web program Google Earth, which took an enormous amount of time. Um, it did end up with videos like this. I'm going to play this. It's going to look probably very archaic to you because as you can see on the bottom, this is from 2012, light years ago, right? As far as technology is concerned. But this is the sort of thing that we could end up with. Um, you could imagine that you're an observer walking on these transects, the red lines, and mapping birds. Um, and once they were placed into Google Earth, we would end up with kind of a comprehensive map of where birds were actually located on a particular site. And so kind of zoom out to the whole site. This was a very early survey um, that actually occurred in Nebraska. So that was pretty cool. Um, so in 2012, we started employing this methodology for the Audubon Conservation Ranching Program. And in 2013, started employing the methodology for surveys on Missouri Department of Conservation Lands and some Missouri Prairie Foundation sites. In the intervening years, we have done bird surveys, sometimes multiple years, um, on almost all of MPF properties. Not quite all of them. Um, we haven't we haven't done up in the Lust Hills um, or Runge Prairie in the northern part of the state, but pretty much all of the other ones. And Ethan's going to show folks how you can actually see the results from those surveys. Um, so during, you know, to to wrap up my history here, during the course of about a decade or so, we went from trying to answer broad scale management questions about grassland birds by doing some banding at three sites to now in the year 2023, we actually did surveys at 90 different sites in 
mostly in Missouri, about 80 sites in Missouri, but also in Kansas and Oklahoma as well. So it's much more efficient. It takes less time. We can do more coverage and we just can get a much more broad scale data set to really try and hone in on what grassland bird populations are doing in our state and also um, at each of the sites that we survey. So an important thing to note here, um, again, just some sort of like aerial imagery, if you will, of bird surveys. But one of the things we do is we run this thing called distance modeling. And this is why the, um, this is how we use the calculations of how far a bird is from a transect. It goes into this engine called distance and Ethan's gonna talk a little bit more about that. But what ends up um, resulting from this are analyses of density and abundance. And this is sort of where we get our trend information. Um, so instead of um, saying, you know, there were, there were 30 birds on the site, we can say there was, there was this many dick thistles per acre. Um, some of it gets a little bit esoteric and not that fun to read. Um, it results sometimes in spreadsheet after spreadsheet of just like little numbers. Um, but one thing that we can do though is really have a numerical um, reference for whether bird populations are increasing or decreasing. So no more, no more paper data sheets and GPS units and entering things into Google Earth. Um, we now do this through mobile data collection and we're able to just map birds on a device now, um, which increases accuracy enormously and also really makes surveys easier because you're doing this right out in the field. You're simply placing birds into, into an app on an aerial image. Um, and it also avoids double counting birds because if you have mapped a bird, you can see where it is. You don't get you know 20 meters, 25 meters farther in your walk and then look and go, did I count that bird already? Because it's already on your map. Um, so this is our newest method and I'm not going to go any further into this because, um, Ethan's going to talk a little bit more about this end of things, but it's really cool to end up with at the end of a day, at the end of a survey morning, um, you have a map like this. And so, especially in terms of working with private landowners, which we do a lot of, um, we can actually meet up with them at the end of a survey morning and say, here's the map already right here. The results are in, here's the map of the, the birds that are on your property. So what we are still working on um, and, and will be working on forever are sort of some feedback for managers, of course, which was really the original purpose of, of the entire project. Um, so we, when we work on large acreages with Department of Conservation, MPF, et cetera. What we're really trying to do is, is provide a, a very quick, almost real-time management feedback loop so that, for instance, with Prairie Foundation, Jared, he, he goes out and he does management actions on an area um, when we come through and survey either you know that year or the next year we can we can kind of say hey jared you know you burned here you did invasive species removal here um this is the bird response here's here's what it looks like on a map here's what how the density has changed in response to your management um as far as small acreages if you will um i just wanted to mention that we do a lot of public outreach with with homeowners um talking about native prairie and why it's, you know, I, I'm sure everyone on this webinar knows how incredibly important it is to plant native plants. Um, but we try and, and talk to folks about why that is and sort of that food web that that is really important for our grassland birds. And so if if folks have even smaller acreages, um, they can they can do a lot to contribute to conservation by restoring prairies even on small plots. So I'm gonna wrap up here by just saying one more thing um, about MRBO is that we are engaged in science-based advocacy. So these data that we collect as well as, as data from other sources, we use them to support conservation-minded practices and policies um, and the farmers and producers in, in Missouri and beyond who employ those conservation-minded practices. There are a lot of good good policies and good science-based um, production practices out there that can be employed. 
I wanted to encourage folks to maybe sign up for our webinar on February 26th. Um, some folks may know Steve Klubein. He is a regular contributor to the Prairie Journal, of course. And he's doing a webinar that's called Your Food, Prairie Birds and Beef Production. And so I wanted to put in a plug for Steve. And Eve, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay. <clears throat> there we go. He's giving me some good options there. That's nice. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I would like to start with this quote here and quickly go through some of how things work for us in the field. But I'd like to acknowledge kind of the forward thinking people of the past because I'm always focused on future stuff. And I just really want to acknowledge um, so, some good forward thinking of the past. And here's a quote about research at the Missouri Department of Conservation, but it reflects kind of the philosophy that we have too. Um, and it says the wildlife agency should be sure that a reasonable amount of in-depth long-term research is carried on. Some of the effort may not appear to be related to the current situation, but no one can really forecast when such knowledge may become key that unlocks the doors to solutions of important uh, that are important to practical wildlife management problems. So I don't know if any of you are real super duper conservation history geeks, but that quote um, came from somebody that we really look up to, the uh, late great and legendary Bill Crawford, who of course has close Prairie Foundation ties. Um, he was just a, he was a man, when he wrote that, um, back in uh, 1967, he was my age then, just a, just a man from Fayette, and he had witnessed the Pittman-Robinson Act, and uh, at the year after the formation of the Conservation Commission in Missouri, so um, one of the first actions taken by that commission was uh, to support co-op research at uh, the University of Missouri, and uh, overhead hasn't been the same since. But um, an underlying message today, though, is really simple. And Dana laid out the plight of the grassland birds, um, really reflective of a lot of the grassland community. And avian indicators are just that one small part, um, but they can show us a lot and they're really in trouble. Uh, so we need to harness every single tool that we have at our disposal to help overcome this. And we can't afford to any longer have a disconnect between research and monitoring and management activities um, and also education and engagement. Um, so we can use some very cool, rapid advancements in technology that are quite recent um, to collect this quality data. And I'm going to show you how we do that, how we can perform insightful analysis and deliver shared and very timely information, as Dana was saying, to all sorts of stakeholders, stakeholders and uh, advocates. So some of you may recognize uh, the background image here. Maybe, maybe some of you do. Um, that's the image from the James Webb State Space Telescope. And I throw this in here because if we can use good old American and international collaboration and ingenuity, to look at the other side of the universe. Just think of what we can do if we harness that to solve some of our conservation challenges. So that's kind of the, the spirit of things. And I'll go right into how we do it. And I just wanna first say, if you're using paper data sheets and data collection, don't do it anymore. <laughs> it's a waste of time and money. We don't wanna, wanna waste time doing that. Modern data workflows can lead to modern data outputs and, and things that we could never imagine doing before. For instance, in this last year on gra grasslands, Dana mentioned, we surveyed over 80 sites. That was a quarter million meters, or Dana likes to say 140 miles of transects. Um, and we detected 30,000 birds. That, that analysis Dana was talking about, density analysis, we were able to complete that for this year, plus rerun it on all previous 12 years for over 100 sites. Also calculate what we call bird friendliness indices. And we're able to do that at, by like high noon a day surveys were completed. That was never heard of before. That couldn't be done before, but now it can be done. And how I do that is I create local layers and a local desktop environment for study design, for bird detections and data collection out in the field. 
all that information, property boundaries, whatever we want to do, point counts, however we want to collect data, whatever uh, scientific uh, methodologies we employ, they can be created in a desktop environment. And then we push them out there to the cloud and they're in a cloud-based uh, system where they can be also accessed via mobile devices or browsers or, or whatnot. And one of the really cool things about it is it's it's all linked together. And then it can all that data that's collected go back through the cloud services and back into our local environments or browsers or wherever we want to serve out the data. We could have multiple surveyors out there collecting data. We could have hundreds of people theoretically collecting data. And it all is housed in a central database. So you can imagine all that data being fed and then being posted out there. So what it looks like in the field is something interesting. And you can imagine this as bird surveyors, but you can imagine people collecting plant data or any type of biological data out there. It could work the same way. Our technicians like to use the iPad minis, so I'll show you that kind of interface. Um, that's, that's what they seem to prefer after a bunch of years out there. Um, and uh, so let's kind of demo this. I'll just kind of show you what it looks like. And as you can imagine, um, sometimes we're in remote settings and we may need to not have access to the internet. So we can we open up our apps and we can access um, a whole slew of different projects that we have. And we can also access um, any sort of uh, base maps that we downloaded while we were online and access those while we were offline. So here's a list of grassland bird projects and available maps. Uh, for collecting data. So this is kind of whatever app interface looks like. Here's going into our grassland bird savers, surveys into, oh, down in the coal camp area, but you can see this is paintbrush prairie. Um, and you can see uh, where our transects are and our grid lines are for surveyors. You can kind of get a good idea of the lay of the land. That's satellite imagery. So you can kind of see where things are at. But as we walk along, we're able to walk the transect and then we'll place a bird using the, sometimes we use the grid lines or references or features in a landscape like that, that uh, scrubby draw right there. And say that in somewhere in that draw, there was a bird that was there. This is how we do it. We click uh, a pop-up menu of our target species. Well, we have all species in there, but our target species is just one quick pop-up for us. Drop the bird right there and boom, data's collected, that's it. But if we wanted to be a little bit more accurate, and this is kind of what we've been doing in the last year or so, we can sideload other imagery. So this is drone imagery that I took out there the day after a burn. And so if we wanted to, we could mark exactly what branch of the shrub the bird was on and locate it there. And that's a really good idea for a base map. That's really useful for us for collecting bird data. Um, but we also uh, have multi-spectral drone data where a lot of plants really pop out and might help with mapping things like invasive species. But there's a bird being put right on the shrub there. And then we can zoom, zoom right out and uh, uh, um, sync, sync our data to the cloud. Uh, so that's, how, that's a quick view of how that works, what it looks like. Um, and it's pretty exciting to be able to use uh, cloud-based services to, again, go from right from the iPad right to the cloud. And then we can crunch data or work on it with our desktop environment. Or also, um, uh, jumped really quickly ahead there, or um, put it push out this data in what we call dashboards. So here's an example right here of uh, an automated deliverable, kind of set up an automated system. It'll push this out during the field season. And this is where Audubon, Audubon's conservation ranching program. So we survey a bunch of sites in Missouri and Kansas and Oklahoma. And landowners like to know pretty soon, you know, what they what's seen out on their land. So pretty much every day I'll update this and they can zoom into their site. They can download a whole species list and they can see a chart. And if they've we've surveyed it previous years, they can see year to year comparisons there. So I want to jump into this real quick because it's it's really important to, in, in our field of science um, to be able to analyze data. This is a very familiar package to a lot of people. It's a very familiar interface. This is called RStudio where you have to code. Uh, we used to use a, a little interface and it was really clunky um, that was user friendly, but not really um, from the distance folks. And I just have to really put out a 
a plug here to that lab, the Buckland Lab in Scotland. And if you get a chance to go to their workshops and you're studying some sort of animal population, I'd highly recommend their workshops. They do them virtually as well, but of course it'd be better to be there in person. But we crunched that data. Um, I wrote, um, we had a, a technician help us uh, write some of that code using distance packages uh, a few years ago. And then I kind of rewrote that code. So last year I wrote about 4,000 lines of code to do this. Um, it's not that I'm the world's best coder. I'll let you in on a little secret. One of the great things about the rapid advance in technology is many of you may have seen this. This is the chat GBT AI interface. So when I run into a roadblock and I'm trying to write some code, whether it's in a Python language for GIS or whether it's for R uh, running those statistical packages, I can quickly ask chat GBT, what's wrong with my code? It's not working. And it'll spit out a, a, a fix for me and put it out there. Um, it's just amazing. This is revolutionizing the way we, we work. And um, these tools have been available in different science disciplines and for different people in different ways, but never like this before. And now it's affordable for those of us in conservation to be able to use. So it's pretty amazing. Um, this is what we dealt with before. We do all that density and abundance estimate. We'd have multiple spreadsheets and we had the ugliest spreadsheet ever known to mankind to work with. And uh, it was just, it was really cumbersome. So we needed to be able to um, generate bird friendliness scores based on some factors I'm going to go by, but that was our way to do it before. Well, we don't have to do that anymore. We can do it all within that R environment, have our data frames really tight, have code run our math for us and, and automate that process. So I'm just going to go over kind of our bird friendly math um, and, and how that works. I know we're, we're getting a, starting to get a little short on time here with uh, at, at being 442. Um, one of the beauties of the system, too, is that we can throw in um, other sorts of attribute data in when that becomes available to help us with things. For instance, I'm able to reach out now to the Avian Conservation Assessment Database, as well as our own uh, database of metrics of conservation values or uh, concern source for species and uh, append that data to any given year for any, any species. Um, for instance, here, um, uh, uh, say a grasshopper sparrow or something like that, we can look at its, its concern value. It's, um, that is based on long-term trends, threats on breeding grounds, threats on wintering grounds, and a host of other factors that um, uh, ornithological experts have, have weighed in on. And so once we're able to do that, um, we, we have automated workflows within GIS to allow us to do, append that data and update it and update our bird friendliness scores or any other sort of outputs that we have. Um, the bird friendly maths are actually pretty simple. Um, we take those right on the left there, you'll see some concern scores. Um, there at the bottom, we see a grasshopper sparrow, let's say it's a 15. Um, so we would take that, that 15 and multiply it by its density. And we do that for all species. And then we'll do an overall uh, diversity score for the grassland obligate species um, uh, within any prairie setting or any, any particular site. And uh, we kind of fold them together to get the bird friendliness indices. And one of the really cool things about it is you can see at the bar chart at the bottom, those are alpha codes for our individual grassland obligate bird species. And those densities that we computed are what are feeding into that bird friendliness score in the top graph. So that's that's how those work. And it can kind of be the explainer for how we get bird friendliness scores. And that comes really important um, when we when we kick out our final dashboard. So cool, right? We we have all that data, we have all those metrics, we can throw them out in this dashboard like this. And um, this data was collected and analyzed at scale. And it, I mean, traditionally this took years to do. You'd have a grad project and you might get your data in a couple of years and it might be in a, on a shelf someplace and you'd have to go uh, look it up or go through a paywall to get your data. But um, this is not the case anymore. And uh, this, this is right at our fingertips and is always going to be non-legacy data, meaning it can be useful. It's not going to be in some other format that people can't use. So we did all this so quickly this year. We're able to develop that bird fineness indices. Um, 
and if we have time, um, we get, we'll be able to drill into specific sites if there's Q&A on that. But this is the screenshot of our operations dashboard for now. Um, I can I can uh, put up a QR code here so you can take a picture of that or screenshot it or what have you and uh, explore at your heart's content at some other time. Um, but the main point here is that we now have this data collected and analyzed at scale and it can be interpreted on a site-by-site -site basis. So data that traditionally took you years to analyze often not shared and certainly not in the most useful formats is right there. So with this dashboard, we can examine exactly where the birds are. We can, we can zoom into any site and see those spatial explicit locations, how they're using that habitat in any given year. And then we can look at the bird friendliness scores and they can be assessed looking at that data um, across years, and it can be downloaded or accessed from the cloud in a browser or a desktop GIS for anybody. And uh, so, yeah, that, that kind of sums that up. And I would like to uh, put a little plug in here uh, for those who are inclined to learn about science and uh, to be practicing science. Uh, I'm trying to organize a tech workshop. It looks like it's probably going to be virtual um, for the time being but I wanna cover things like mobile data collection, GIS workflows, data sharing, operations dashboards, some drone stuff, um, drone imagery and analysis, uh, invasive species tracking and other, other tools for challenges that we have. Maybe a little bit on uh, that could be useful for law enforcement or protection. And uh, maybe have somebody talk about MODIS and, and future monitoring. So there's lots of cool tech things and I just wanna speed through here. Um, and open it up for questions. Also, um, I saw some of the questions pop up earlier and I have another slide to answer at least one of those questions. So I can always pop that up. But I uh, just wanna say thanks again to the uh, Prairie Foundation for hosting us and all the great things that they do. If a couple of folks ask specifically about the bird friendliness calculations. Sure, um, sure think... we can uh mm -hmm. Kristen asked to actually go back to that slide yep bird friendly mass yes mm -hmm. so uh if you could read off any particular question uh that was the uh, I mean one of one of the questions was could you go back to the slide and then um Mel says what factors go into assessing the bird friendliness scores so basically these things I think that you're about to pull up right yeah. Okay. So we'll go back again to it. I know it, it can be a little challenging at first because we might not be used to thinking of this way, but I'll start out in philosophy and then go into practice. So imagine you have a suite of birds out there. Some of them are more rare or declining more rapidly globally. And uh, we, we need to have some way of, um, of, of a metric applied to that. Like what is what should our concern be beyond um, threatened, endangered, or typical kind of watch list criteria? Let's get let's boil it down to a, another metric. So um, at at uh, um, bird conservation, uh, bird conservancy of the Rockies, uh, formerly Rocky Mountain Bird Observatory, they they house this partners in flight database and assessment database. Um, but they they bring in factors such as the total population size, um, breeding distribution, population trends, um, threats to birds like maybe habitat loss or other factors that they may have mentioned there um, on, on their breeding grounds, uh, relative density. There's a whole bunch of different features trying to get a value. So we take our estimates of density that we get. So remember Dana was saying, we can't just walk out into uh, a, uh, a prairie and say, okay, well, I saw 23 dick thistles, so there must be, oh, I would guess 30 here. Uh, we use a very r robust methodology, um, and, and we have a very fine measure of effort, and we can estimate, um, we, we use calculations to estimate our detection probability of each individual species. And then we use that as a factor 
when we're trying to estimate the actual densities of these of these critters out there. So we use that concerns value, multiply that by the species density, and then we add in the overall property diversity metric. And a diversity score is looking at just that suite of grassland obligate species, how many of them how many species are represented there? How many of those species that we're concerned about were found there? And it gives us an idea of, of that diversity of those grassland obligates. So all those get pulled together to come up with the uh, bird finest score. And as you can see down at the bottom again, those are just the densities. But you can see this is like for a given site. And I have selected the year 2023. And that is the bird finest score on top. And that is that is being driven by the densities and the concern values of the species. So let me know if that answered that okay. Well, let me just say the, the science behind it looks robust, <laughs> and um, it's just amazing to 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 hear that in a span of you know just about a decade, right? You guys have gone from paper surveys to this really advanced um, model for conducting your surveys and getting all of this great data. So um, it is really remarkable to see. So yeah. thank you guys for that. Um, but it looks very complicated at the same time. So, and I think some of our, uh, you know, viewers today are uh, really interested in this work and actually even uh, one person at least um, asked how they can, or if it's possible for it, for them to volunteer to help conduct some of these surveys. Is that a possibility or is this just left better left to the scientists? Yeah, I'll stop my share here so I can see things and what's going on here in the chat and the Q and A as well. Um, Dana, I don't know if you want to answer this, but, um, we do have a, uh, current, we actually hire technicians. Typically, it isn't a volunteer type of thing. Um, typically, volunteers don't want to get up every single morning before dawn, covering 80 over 80 sites throughout multiple states and sticking to a rigid time frame of which to collect the data. And there's no wandering off and enjoying things. You have to walk your transect lines and get as many done as we can in a set time window so that we we rule out as many confounding variables of detectability as possible. So it's a pretty it's a pretty rigid thing. That being said, if somebody is really excellent with their birds, um, that's the key thing that we we look for when we go to hire uh, for our, our grassland technician positions. And uh, last year we had an absolute dream team, just a great group of people um, and super birders out there. Great. So our, our our job post is listed on our website, so you can put it there. Okay, perfect. Well, um, as a follow up to that. Um, Marjorie had asked, and maybe you had already answered this, Dana, but had asked how many researchers do you have working on a particular, you know, project at a time? I Yeah, I don't know if everyone can see typed answers in the Q&A, hopefully. Um, but overall on the project, it's basically the two of us. Ethan built all of the things that he just talked about. Um, but during the field season, which is about late April to mid-July, we do have three to five seasonal technicians, and that's what Ethan was just talking about, um, the job posting that's out there. And yes, birders most welcome. Um, and then I just, I did want to, I put this in the Q&A, but uh, I did want to mention that a lot of this is also informed by the Department of Conservation and the Prairie Foundation and others that we work with. So, I mean, all throughout the year, year round, it's kind of Ethan and I doing this, but there really is a lot of other um, involvement by various partners. And then the technicians are, I mean, two of us can't cover 80,000 acres in, in two months. So. All right. Well, thanks for that. 
Uh, we'll definitely, in our follow-up email, um, provide information on uh, those, uh, where they can, people can go to look at those uh, seasonal position openings. Um, another question uh, that kind of is, uh, I think, on a lot of our minds when we see the uh, sort of statistics on bird populations um, and the, those declines, you know, people want to know what they can do, right? And and um, and then they start being more observant too in their own spaces. But Carol um, asked, or she asked if, um, if there is evidence of a permanent decline or some seasonal phenomenon because just at her own feeders um, in her own yard, she's seeing um, a lot less birds. So if, if one of you could maybe speak to that. That is a great question, Carol. Um, I feel like we feel the same way um, about our feeders um, and have heard it from many other people. Um, so my feeling that my bird feeders aren't as populated and you feeling that way as well is of course anecdotal right information we can't it's it's we're we are not collecting that information at our feeders in a standardized way so we can't really say like yes definitely um in, in order for us to do that right we would need to watch our feeders exactly the same amount of time for exactly the same length of time, say every day, all winter for two hours. And then we'd have to take into account things like, you know, temperature variations, right? Snow on the ground, all kinds of different factors. Um, so we can't, from the scientific standpoint, say definitively, like, yes, there are less birds at my feeder or your feeder. But um, we do have via, you know, studies like the one I talked about from 2019, and then data from uh, just tons of different researchers that are conducting surveys, including in urban and suburban areas in a very standardized fashion that are showing us that birds are in fact declining. Um, so unfortunately, I, I think that the, the standardized scientific, you know, rigorous protocol methodology is basically backing up what we're seeing anecdotally around us. Um, so we've lost a lot of birds. That's a that's a great transition into um, these other sources of citizen science data collection. So it's a great time to plug uh, Cornell's uh, Great Backyard Bird Count and their feeder watch programs. A lot of these massive data sets, I saw somebody reference that er earlier, um, different uh, large scale projects like uh, eBird or um, uh, the Christmas Bird Counts. Those things are are used to uh, empower the data that we referenced earlier about determining concern scores and things like that. Um, they're very appropriate for kind of large scale um, and regional kind of trend. And that type of information is really helpful. Breeding bird surveys are also a big contributor to those data sets and uh, assessing trends. And so, please consider um, volunteering for those and contributing to eBird and those things because they help at those particular scales. What we do at, um, across the large area is that very detailed find, kind of fine scale assessments. Um, so uh, at, there's a place for all of that. <laughs> we need all of that. For sure. And uh, someone had asked the question of, of you, Ethan, whether the app that you're using is available for uh, the public. Um, and so if you could speak to that. Yeah, it's a it's a, a licensed uh, app that we, we use. Um, that said, it is um, scalable. Um, there's versions of it that are scalable. Um, so I use ESRI's field maps used to be called collector and so that's all built within that um, software platform um, but they also have a thing called survey one two three that you may have seen uh, we we share links out for things like our our uh, uh, bird safe kc project and stuff like that if people there's qr codes out there on the on buildings and things or if people find dead birds they can report them through that so there's there's ways to do that um, and uh, but uh, 
ours definitely is not like shareable to everybody for this particular project. Right. And there's a little bit of a learning curve there, it looks like, as well. Yeah, but so. far less than there once was. When I started doing this, there was like I had to code the apps. I don't have yeah. to code the apps anymore. Right. Well, um, some other questions that have come in um, that I thought were, were interesting. Um, Anne had asked, does um, public visitations to these areas, these, you know, um, bird friendly areas that that you're pinpointing um, cause adverse effects to bird populations? And <laughs> it, either it, one of you can go uh, for that um, one. You all ask complex questions with complex <laughs> answers. Um, a couple of things that come to mind first, and then if you probably have other thoughts as well. Um, largely, no. I think that, you know, especially folks that honestly would be an, attending a webinar like this one are going to be respectful to organisms that are on any site that they go to visit. Um, some of our prairies in the state of Missouri are visited probably over much, and that is by... Um, folks of uh, across the gamut like I'm even speaking including researchers um, I personally my opinion is it's never a good thing to be driving something like an ATV or a truck across a prairie um, that uh, can do all kinds of damage as you can imagine especially during um, bird nesting season but there's things that can be crushed damaged destroyed at other times of year as well um, on the flip side of that I feel that to most people, again, not the folks on this webinar right now, but in general, prairies are incredibly underappreciated. Um, I feel that we, I have noticed a cultural bias, I think, towards woods um, and woodlands. And and I, I really wish that people would get out on prairies more and, you know, carefully and respectfully walk around. But I don't think that most of our prairies get the visitation that they deserve. Um, so... I mean, overall, my answer to that question would be no, as long as people are careful. Yeah, with birds, I'd be very careful during nesting season. You know, um, usually it's, if you're out in the prairie, it's usually safer near the tree or edges. Um, typically, most of our, our declining species like to be out in the prairie further. Oftentimes, they're nesting within or beneath clumps of vegetation. So... Prairie aficionados typically don't want to step directly on a bunch of grass anyways. You know, they've learned how to kind of walk around them. So that's that's one thing. And, and there could be some disturbance, but they're they're pretty the the way that the nests are distributed across the landscape um tends to make them less susceptible to to being stomped on and trampled on and things like that. So just I would just advise caution. And definitely as Dana said, um it's just a necessary evil to drive out there sometimes if you're using an ATV to spot spray, you know, invasives and things like that. I mean, we just try to minimize and use common sense because we have been loving our prairies to death out there. Um, so we just have to be careful with that. And I noticed there's a, there tends to be less human impact of that nature on Missouri Prairie Foundation properties. And there are a lot of other public use spaces for multiple uses. Um, and also, I will throw a plug out there for drones and the use of drones in the future that that will miss it by it'll we won't have as much uh, um, need to drive around out there now that we have drones that can do the assessment for us and also in the future, uh, you know, apply uh, herbicide and very precise locations. All right. All right. Thank you. Um, I thought this was a neat question that I um, hadn't considered, but Jackie wanted to know if the cicada emergence could be a beneficial uh, with, you know, with this year being a, the, I, I don't know the science behind it, but basically they're emerging. Would this be helpful to the bird populations or could be? Potentially. Yes. Those are, those are big under their, crunchy wings and stuff, soft bodied, very tasty <laughs> insects, full of protein. 
Um, so yes, I, I could see, I don't, I don't know the science behind it either, Haley. Like I don't, I not having a study off the top of my head saying, you know, in the last cicada emergency year, like bird populations <laughs> rebounded. Um, but certainly they're going to be a good source of food. Absolutely. So certain species really will take advantage of it more than others. And uh, they do time their emergence to be on the prime number of years and things like that so that uh, other species can't predict, I guess, and take advantage of of those hatching years. So they'll just be overwhelmed. Okay. Right. Tricky guys, aren't they? Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see. Um, and Melanie wanted to know if, if, you know, through your data collection um, and, and the different methods you've used, have you... Have, have any of your findings surprised you? It's kind of broad. That is. If yeah, I, I guess you know they not too many big surprises. I think that now that we've got this down, we're waiting for people to maybe be able to use these data to um refine uh, bird reliance on specific structures, specific plant communities, more finding or, or could be something else we haven't thought of yet. Um, but with it, this is, data has never been collected in this spatially explicit format either, which lends itself to a lot of other types of analyses. So I think future surprises are, are going to come about. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, one of the things that I thought was pretty neat is we used to do more repeat visits because we wanted to make sure we had the sample size. And what we would do is just survey the whole thing again. And what we found is we could almost completely overlay the data because the birds just, and during breeding season, they really do stick to these same areas. And so, um, it just, it just what goes to show how predictable birds can be, uh, during breeding season on the landscape. Nice. Very good. Um, let's see. I think we have, um, oh, another one, another question that just came in was from Cynthia, and she wanted to know if you perform these studies in woodlands as well. Sometimes, not nearly as often, um, mainly because, though, our Missouri woodlands are really, really excellent. Um, they there are more of them, and they are historically better managed. Um, by which I mean, really good stewardship of Missouri's forests started earlier um, than our prairies and and things like marshes um, and bottomlands, and there are simply more of them left. Also, um, there are historically more studies in forests um, than in prairies. So while we've done a little bit as an organization and it's wonderful, um, I'm in no way knocking the Missouri Ozark forest whatsoever. It's really neat. Um, we, do, we don't do that work as much. Okay. Um, you know, and just to kind of uh, wrap this up, uh, we did have some questions about, uh, you know, our renewable energy projects, um, such as wind turbines threatening our birds, um, you know, our pet That's cats. That's a big one. Oh, oh, yeah. Cats. Yeah, yeah. Cats, yeah, yeah. cats are easy. Wind turbines are a lot right. more complex. <laughs> Here okay, we go. there you go. <laughs> yeah. So um, this can help put it in perspective about, so these are causes of direct mortality on our bird population. So... Um, I mean, there's a lot of other factors, but um, you can see that cats are definitely take up the biggest chunk of that. Uh, that's just, uh, they have a, a tremendous impact on uh, our, our bird populations and uh, small mammals and, and uh, herpifauna and uh, even insects. But um, so windows, window collisions are also a big leading thing. Okay, so we have uh, vehicles, and if we had wind down here, it would be uh, one of the even the smaller, small, much smaller amount. There's another one Dana might be able to find that has uh, the, the it's it's lumped in there with industrial. Okay, so it's part of industrial, um, but it's still. I mean, it's not 
it's not great it's not ideal but it's it's far 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 less than vehicles windows and cats um so yes keeping your cats indoors and i mean that's a number one super easy thing that individuals can do that makes huge impact right and then again as you mentioned at the beginning of the webinar um you know trying to bring some of that habitat um recreate some of that habitat that has been lost in your own yards or properties is another huge way to to help um, kind of restore what's been lost absolutely. wouldn't you guys agree absolutely That's native huge. plants native plants native plants yep. totally <laughs> all right well i think that is pretty much all of the questions that came through so i uh, just want to thank you both again for your time and your all of your efforts that you've put into uh, bird conservation in our state and the surrounding areas. So um, we just really appreciate all that you all are doing. Um, and for all of you uh, on the webinar, as mentioned before, this is being recorded and an email will be sent to you tomorrow with the link to the webinar and other resources mentioned during this presentation. And if you enjoyed this presentation, we hope that you'll join us for our Missouri Prairie Foundation webinar um, two weeks from today on February 28th. It's a, entitled A Primer on Plant Morphology with mm -hmm. Dr. Michelle That's Bowie. So she will be able to provide some uh, information on uh, the finer details of plants. So uh, again, thank you all so much for joining us this evening and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Haley. Thanks, MPF. Thank you. Have a great night.